It is good to be in the house of God. It is very good. The song that they just sang kind of goes along with what I'm going to be ministering on this morning. Kind of verifies and backs up what Brother Sperling taught on last Sunday. On praise and worship, it kind of goes in that direction. Why are we having so-called what you think is a repeat? I don't know. Maybe we just haven't got it and God wants, wants us to hear it again. You know, we always have to be reminded, even myself, reminded of the goodness of God and what he has done for us. I mean, I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for him and how he has helped me through the years. That's the honest truth. Honest truth this morning. So, and you might hear some familiar scriptures that's been taught on in the last couple of weeks too. So, as, I, as they were teaching, I said, boom, I can use that, pal. And Brother Spurlock last week, I said, I can use those scriptures too. Boom. So you may hear some repeats, but that's just how God works. That's just how he works. And it lets me know that we as the body and as the ministry in this church, that we are somewhat united and we are following after God's heart. What, you know, because it all just ties in together. All right, let us pray this morning because I'm going to need it. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you again for this opportunity to be in your house, Lord, to worship, to praise, and to magnify your name, Lord. Lord Jesus, and to bring down the strongholds like that psalm had said, Lord, and to, to live and to breathe, to worship you, Lord God. That should be our, our everyday thing, to live, to breathe, to worship, to praise, and to magnify you, Lord. But Lord, I pray this morning that you anoint these lips of clay, Lord, that you will speak through me, Lord, that you will speak through me as I've seen it in my mind's eye, Lord God. Lord, that I'm not boring to the people this morning, Lord, that I have a word from you to, to deliver to them, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that our ears are open to hear and this seed falls on good ground, oh God. That our minds are focused on thee this morning, Lord. Lord Jesus, because we can have church this morning in the house of God. Lord, and I also pray for the other Sunday school teachers, Lord, that a mighty move of the power of God will fall into those rooms, Lord, and children can be born again of the water and of the Spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord Jesus, just... Keep us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Let us, let, us, let us be in your word this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord. Also, I come up against any hindering spirit that may come into this place. Lord, that will try to hinder your word going forth. Try to hinder the work that you want to do in this place. I bind it in the name of Jesus. And I cast it into the outer darkness from which it came. And I release your liberty in your power and your spirit into this place, Lord God, that they may be freedom, Lord, to in the spirit this morning. And all these things I ask in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's give him some praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord, you are great and greatly to be praised. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You can stand if you want for the word, but it's just a simple, just a simple verse this morning. I'm going to be pulling out of the book of Psalms, the 23rd chapter, fifth verse. You got to say amen. amen. That's a lot of amens. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Let us pray again that God anoint his word this morning. Lord Jesus, we just pray, Lord, that you will anoint this word that you have given unto me, Lord, that you will let me break forth the bread of life, Lord Jesus. Lord, with enthusiasm, with love, with compassion, Lord Jesus. Lord God, this, it is your word, not mine, Lord. Speak through me this morning, Lord. I am unable to do it within myself. I'm not a great orator, oh God, but I believe and trust in you this morning, Lord, to use these lips, Lord, to speak your word. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord Jesus, praise his holy name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Y'all can be seated this morning. Oh, Lord Jesus, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou knownest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. 
Brother Smith, I believe, a couple of weeks ago, taught on the, Psalm, the 23rd Psalms. This particular scripture hit me. I'm like, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The title of my, me my sermon message, however you want to call it, is Feasting in the Face of Our Enemies. God has prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies. 2 Kings chapter 7, it'd be verses 1 through 11. It talks about four leopards. Verse 1. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a lord of whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? So he was doubting the prophet. Yeah. And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. That's what the prophet told the naysayer. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Now, why were these leprous men at the gate? It says in Leviticus, Leviticus 13 and 46, all the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. Without the camp shall his habitation be. So if you were a leprous person, you were outside the camp. Therefore, he was outside the gates of the city. Numbers, three, um, numbers 5, verses 2 through 3, kind of say the same thing in a way. Command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper and every one that hath an issue and whosoever is defiled by the dead. Both male and female shall ye put out without the camp, shall ye put them, that they defile not their camps in the midst whereof I dwell. So God didn't want anything unclean where he dwells, which is true. He will not dwell in an unclean heart. Well, that's why he says it's, oh, he will dwell in the heart of those that are pure heart, True worshipers, true, true praisers. You got to have a clean heart, just like David says, "Create in me a clean heart, O God, that I might not sin against Thee." Create in me a clean heart, because God would not dwell in an unclean space. What is leprosy? In today's terms, it's called Hansen's disease. It is an infection caused by bacteria that will grow very slowly and it may take up to 20 years to develop signs of the infection. So you may have it and not never know it. The disease can affect the nerves, skin, eyes, and lining of the nose. The bacteria attacks the nerves which can become swollen under the skin. That's why in the Bible if there was a red spot, talking about leprosy being a red spot, it was under the skin. This can cause the affected areas to lose the ability to sense touch and pain, which can lead to injuries like cuts and burns. Usually the affected skin changes colors and either becomes lighter or darker, often dry or flaky, with loss of feeling, or reddish due to inflammation of the skin. If left untreated, the nerve damage can result in paralysis of hands and feet. In very advanced cases, the person may have multiple injuries due to lack of sensation, and eventually the body may reabsorb the affected digits over time, resulting in the apparent loss of toes and fingers. Ulcers and blindness can also occur if facial nerves are affected. Other signs of advanced Hansen's disease may include loss of eyebrows and saddle nose deformity resulting from damage to the nasal septum. In the past, this disease was feared as a highly contagious, devastating disease, but now we know that it's hard to spread and it's easily treatable once recognized. Now, back in the Bible day, it couldn't be treated. They didn't have the medicines as of today and everything that's been done. But back then, it was a feared disease. And they had to go around claiming unclean, unclean, until like 
if the Lord or they got healed from it, then they went through a process before they can get back into the camp and can be considered clean. Now back to 2 Kings chapter 7, go to verse 4. If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. So they were going to die either way, eventually. Now therefore come and let us fall onto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. That was a sad situation for them. They were going to sit there outside the gate and die. They go inside the gate, they die. They go to the enemy's camp, they're going to die. That was a sad situation. And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come against us. So the Syrians thought a great host was coming to their camp when it was only four leprous men. God made them sound so loud as they were walking towards the camp that they fled. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was. They fled for their life. So they left everything behind. They were so scared, they left everything behind. If they had only waited, they would only seen that it was four leprous men, but that wasn't what God wanted. He made them sound like a great multitude, and the Syrians ran from their tents and left everything behind. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went in one tent and did eat and drink. And carried then silver and gold and raiment, and went and hid it, and came again, and entered into another tent, and carried thence also, and went and hid it. They feasted in the enemy's camp. They had a blast in the enemy's camp. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied and asses tied in the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. This was the fulfilling of the prophecy of the prophet. But those four leopards feasted in the face of their enemy because God chased the enemy away made those four lepers sound like a huge army it was just four men and all the hosts of the Syrians left that the prophecy may be fulfilled and if you read on in the further in that chapter you will see that the man that was the naysayer did not partake of the prophecy he was actually trampled to death. And as I was going over this lesson, uh, there was another couple of other names that came to mind. Saul and David. Now, you, you can look in 1 Samuel. It would be 1 Samuel chapters 16 through 19 is where this is coming from. In chapter 16, God departed from Saul. Because Saul had already messed up. He had already disobeyed God. And he, God took the anointing from him. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. This is chapter 16, verse 14. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. It was an evil spirit from God. God sent the evil spirit to him. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is cunning player uh, on a harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. So in other words, his men were saying you need somebody to play music for you. 
so that their troubled spirit could be settled. That's so true. You know, even beasts in the field, you play music of a certain time, they will calm down. This music has a way of calming people. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of his servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethleh, Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in manners, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with thy sheep. This is the first time Saul meets David. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. Oh, sorry, I skipped a verse. A few of them. And Jesse took, verse 20, And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid, and then sent them by David as son, his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him gently, greatly. And he became his armor bearer. First time meeting him, and that David's already an armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So this is where Saul meets David. David's already been anointed. But, and David is called upon into the king's house to play music when the evil spirit comes upon him so that it will go away, that he can calm down. But David is feasting in his enemy's camp, not knowing that Saul's his enemy just yet. But you've got to know that David is eating off the king's table. The king's not going to bring him into the fold and not feed him. Though there were kings that did do such. Chapter 17, it deals with David and Goliath and the, the mighty works that he did there. But in chapters 18 and 19, it deals with King Saul wanting to kill David because of how the Lord had blessed him. In um, 18, verses 5 through 9, this is Saul's jealousy of David. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him. And behaved himself wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of, the, of all cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, with instruments of music. They were coming out to celebrate. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth. And he's saying this, and the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousand, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? So Saul was saying, What can he have more? Is he after my throne? Is he going to take over? And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. If you go on a little further in verses 10 through 16, Saul's trying to kill David. Even sitting at the table, I think he throws a javelin at him twice. And David missed, uh, he missed David. David was able to escape. But it goes on that David was still being blessed. He's sitting at the king's table, being blessed, even though the king wants to kill him. He's being blessed. Even in chapter 19, Saul tries to kill David. He wants him dead. But David escaped through, the, through his, his wife's deception of her father. He was able to escape. Even Jonathan couldn't believe that his father wanted David dead, but he soon believed because there was a, there was a covenant between them 
that if his father Saul wanted David dead, that he would shoot some arrows out and say, go beyond, and David would know to leave and not come back. And that's what happened. Because Saul was so angry and jealous of David because God was blessing him. The anointing was on David. Not on him any longer. And he was jealous. He was always wanting Jonathan not to do, have anything to do with David because Jonathan would be the rightful heir. But that's not how God worked. God saw Saul, Saul's heart, and Saul disobeyed God, had sin in his life. He took it away from him, gave the kingdom to David. So he was right in being angry in some aspect, but he was wrong in others. You can't stop what God has started. But David feasted in the presence of his enemy. In the presence of the king, the king that hated him, he still sat there and ate. And God blessed him. That made things worse for David because Saul did not like it. He did not like it. Paul and Silas, this is something Brother Sperling came across in the Roman jail. Acts chapter 16 verses 22 through 35. And the multitude rose up together. I mean, he, he only hit at certain spots of it, but you need to know why Paul and Silas were in the jail. The multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. So they were beat. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. They had many stripes. They had been beaten for preaching the word. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them in the inner prison, the center, the innermost part, and made their feet fast in stocks. So in other words, they were locked down. Couldn't move. And they were in the innermost part of the jail. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. They have been beaten. Stripes upon their back. In the innermost part. And what do they do? In the face of their enemies. They begin to pray and to sing praises in the midnight hour and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed not just Paul and Silas everyone was loosed feasting in the enemy's camp Feasting in the face of your enemy. Their enemy threw them in jail, but yet they began to feast on God spiritually. Praying and worshiping Him. And what does God do? He does a mighty work. Does a mighty work. He opens the doors. He sets every captive free. Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And when he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling, he fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Amen. This is the anointing part in Psalms 23.5. He anointed me. He anointed my head with oil. This is where it's at. They eight in the face of their enemy they worship and praise God and what happened somebody was saved God opened the door for someone to receive salvation if they had not done that this man would have been lost and it wouldn't be in the Bible they worshipped and they praised and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. 
And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And they took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all his straightway. So they cleaned up the disciples and they were baptized. Mm -hmm. And when he had brought them into the house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the surgeons saying, let those men go. Let them go. They were already free. <laughs> I mean, there was nothing holding them back. They could have left any time. But it was a work of God in the face of the enemy. It was a great move of God. They sang and they prayed in the midnight hour. They could have said, woe is me. They could have just gone with the flow. But no, they made up their mind that this is not how it's going to end. Now going back to the 23rd Psalms, the 5th verse. Thou preparest. Preparest is a second person singular simple present form of prepare. Present form. That means now. Preparest. Now. In the presence. Anointest is the same. It means in the present tense. It's now. Presence is the immediate vicinity, proximity of someone or something. The fact that someone or something is in a place, the state of being somewhere. In other words, in the presence, I'm in your presence. We are all in God's presence. But he prepares the table in the presence of your enemies. Those who fight against you, those who persecute you, those who do bad things against you. Your enemies, the people who do not like you, do bad things to you, say bad things about you. The ones that we're supposed to pray for, pray for your enemies. Now, this hits home to me because I've lived this. I've lived this. There was a time in my life when I was cut off from the body of Christ alienated from the body of Christ because of some false accusation against me. I was, I was talked about in the whole section. But the truth of the matter was I didn't commit the sin I was accused of. But did I say anything? No. Like Jesus, I kept my mouth shut because lies spread faster than the truth. And people didn't want to hear the truth. So I kept the truth to myself. Others knew the truth. God knew the truth. I kept my mouth shut. What I did do, though, is I worshipped and I praised. There was nothing they could do to stop me. Nothing. And they couldn't handle the fact that God was blessing me in the mess. I didn't put blame on anybody. I could have. I could have had a better spirit towards people because of how they've treated me. But I didn't do that. I put that in God's hands. I worshiped and praised. And God fed me in the midst of my enemies. And they couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle it. They says, why is this happening? He didn't, no, I didn't do what you accused me of. God knows the truth. He knew I was innocent of the accusation. And he had his hand on me. We used to have a, a certain, I don't, know, I don't know if they were a group or, or a certain family used to come and sing at the church every year. They were very gifted. They could, they could see things in the Spirit of God. Very gifted people. And they were there and we had an awesome service. God moved. He moved mightily. And at the end, they always had prayer for people. And they asked me to come up. And this lady told me, <coughs> see if I can get through this, that she saw angels with flaming swords fighting the demons, plaguing my soul. And the hand of the Lord was extending to me, white in purity, his hand in my hand. Let me tell you, that meant something to me. Knowing that God had me in that time. 
in the midst of my enemies he had my hand he knew I was right in the face of my enemies I feasted feasted greatly Satan could not stop me just like the Gadarean as um, brother Sperling talked about last last Sunday this was a man that had many devils many they called him legion we don't actually know the exact number of legion thank you brother we don't know the exact number it really doesn't say you know there was a number of swine that they entered into but who's to say that's the exact number of devils that was in this man he had many devils in him but they could not keep him from bowing down to Jesus and worshiping him they could not stop this man from bowing down and worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is a man who dwelt in tombs and cut himself. Wasn't in his right mind. But he saw Jesus and these devils couldn't stop him. The only people, only person that can stop us is ourselves. We are our worst enemies. We are our worst enemies. If 2,000 plus, however many devils was in this man, couldn't stop him from worshiping at the foot of Jesus, why should we let things stop us? We, you know, if we are blood-bought, born again, got the Spirit of God dwelling inside us, there should be no devil in hell stopping us from getting what we need to have or receiving what God wants us to have or living a life that is righteous before God. Devils couldn't stop him. Devils couldn't stop me either. I'd already made up my mind. It didn't matter what came my way. It didn't matter what the situation was. I was not going to give up on God. I was still going to give my worship. I was still going to give him praise. It didn't matter if I understood what it was. It didn't matter why I was going through it. God knew. And he had a plan. I came out on the other side smelling like roses, people. God worked it all out. All I had to do was worship, praise, and feast in the presence of my enemies. Satan's desired my soul for quite some time. He knows if I ever get my P's and Q's lined up that he's in trouble. He's been after me so many times. I've had dreams where Satan says, you can speak in tongues all you want, but you have no power. I've got you where I want you. I got news for you, Satan. You don't have me. My God has me. And he ain't through with me yet. He ain't through with me yet. I, he ain't done with me. So, you know, he, he's always been trying to trip me up with something, some way. Because he knows if he can keep me down, he's safe. He is safe. We're in the last days. Everything around us is going the pot. Everything that we've stood for is being said it's bad. It's not good anymore. That's God's word. Where good has become bad and bad is good. Where things of the world have changed. People don't want God. But they don't know that they need God. All right. They're pushing stuff on us that's ungodly. Come on. Yeah. Ungodly. Yeah. An abomination in the eyes of God. Yeah. Come on. But if you say something like that, that's a hate crime, people. Mm. You can't even tell these people that this is something God does detest mm. without risking the chance of going to jail. Yeah. But it's true. But the truth of the matter is, we might not like what they do, but we still got to pray for their soul. They still need Jesus. They still need Jesus. And believe me, if they find out you're a Christian, they're going to come to you and try to corner you. It's happened. I worked at a company in Columbus, and it seemed like there had to be a bunch of um, homosexuals that worked there. Well, when they found out I went to church, they came right to me. And they were asking me all kinds of questions. And I told them, I says, look, I don't have to like what you do, but I have to love your soul. 
Because that's what God commands. And says, I might not like the lifestyle that you live, but I've got to love your soul. And I will pray for you. After that, they left me alone. But you can feast in the presence of your enemies. We don't have to let the enemy beat us down. We don't have to live a defeated life. We can still have the joy of the Lord in the midst of the situation. To have that peace in our lifestyle, in our hearts, in our soul. Though your enemy is raging around you, you can feast at the master's table. He's prepared it for us. He prepares it. So it's an everyday, it's right now. He prepares the table in front of us. He anointed our head with the, that our cup runneth over. Blessings upon blessings upon blessings. Our cup runneth over. Worship and praise is the key. As I was doing this message, there was this old song, old hymn kept coming to my mind. It's an old hymn. Come and dine. Jesus hath, has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people, come and dine. With his manna he doth feed and supplies our every need. Oh, tis sweet to sup with Jesus all the time. Come and dine, the master calleth. Come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry calleth now. Come and dine. Come and dine. The master calleth. Come and dine. Come and dine in the face of your enemy. Come and have the anointing put upon your head. Have the blessings in your life in the face of your enemy. They can't handle that. They don't like it when you're being blessed, when they think you should be cursed. Uh -uh. I'm a child of God. Greater is he that is in me than those that I face. Even church people, sometimes they get the wrong idea. Sometimes the thoughts, and, and they do things that are wrong. We're human. We're not perfect. We all make mistakes. But even they can hurt you. Even they can be an enemy. They can. I hope there's none in this place. I hope, hope not. I hope we're all in one mind, one accord, all united together in Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what our faults are. Doesn't matter what we, who we are. We should be able to come together in one mind and one accord. If we've got alt, I pray that we ask forgiveness. That you can bring your gift before God. And own it, please. I mean, don't hide from it. Own it. I did wrong. I hurt you. I ask your forgiveness. And I'll ask your forgiveness if I've hurt or caused you any pain. I want to be able to bring my gifting before God. I can't bring it before God if I know that I've hurt somebody. If I know that there is aught against me. I can't come before you. I can't stand behind this pulpit to teach. I can't do it. I would be within myself in the flesh. When I'm up here, I let God work. This is not me. This, no, this is not me. I was never a very, let's say, extrovert type person growing up. Very much an introvert, very timid and shy. Couldn't speak to anybody, let alone get behind the pulpit. I was 14 when I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's taken him 30-some years to get me here. 
30 some years to get me here. But that's what the Holy Ghost would do. It would take a shy, timid person, put boldness in his life to be what I am today. It's all God, people. There is no way, there is no way within myself you'd see me up here. I'd be running out the back door. I remember speech classes. Couldn't do it. Nervous as all get out. But the Lord helps you grow. This is a much a reminder for me as it is for anybody that God brought me out of a terrible situation because I was feasting at the Master's table. I was giving Him the glory. I was giving him the praise. Hallelujah. Drove my enemy crazy. Hmm. And I came out on the end. On the other side, blessed. Hallelujah. Blessed. God's hand upon me. Angels fighting my battles. Hmm. Oh. Flaming swords. Hmm. Fighting off demons that were plaguing my soul. Hmm. I tell you what. When she, when she told me that, I jumped out my skin. Hmm. It had me a good shout moment. To know that God was with me. Hallelujah. You know, just like he said last Sunday in the, in the tongues and the interpretation. I inhabit the praises of my people. He inhabits. He lives within our praises. So why don't we praise him? If you're going through a rough spot, praise him. If you can't see the end, praise Him. For He is good. He woke you up this morning. He put breath into you this morning. He gave you another day to worship Him, to be in His presence. He gave you life. We should praise Him. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It even says, you know, you can't even enter in. God's presence without being thanksgiving and praise. Can't even enter into the courts of the tabernacle without having thanksgiving and praise. That is the first step into entering into the holies of holies. Worship and praise. Now, praise goes further. As the more you do it, it goes into worship and the magnifying Him. But this is key to our life, people. Yes, we have the sword. We have a two-edged sword. We've got scriptures that will back us up that we can fight the devil with. But we've got something that Satan desires to take from us that's easy to do. Worship and praise Him. I mean, if I can make it through a tough situation in my life because of worship and praise, defeating my enemy just because I'm feasting at the Master's table, Anybody can face it. Anybody can do it. Like I said, it doesn't matter hell or high water. It doesn't matter what you're faced with. It doesn't matter if the devil is right in your face. Worship. Praise. And see if he doesn't leave you alone for a while. See if God doesn't answer. Or give you an answer in the situation that you're in. That is the greatest weapon of warfare that we have is our worship and praise. If Satan can take that from us, he has us. And to be honest with you, I don't want to give him anything. He's already robbed us. I'm still re being on the road of restoration from the men's conference last year. I'm still being restored. I'm not 100%, but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm done with him. He's done enough in my life. I'm through. Jesus is who I trust. Jesus is my friend. And Jesus is greater than he is. My daddy can beat your daddy up. Sometimes we need to be like little children. Have that childlike faith. My daddy can beat you up. My daddy's greater than you are. 
He made the heavens and the earth. What did you do? He hung on a cross. What did you do? He died for my sins. What did you do? You all, all you did was cause trouble in this world that God had to fix. So it lets me know who's the most powerful. Lord Jesus, I hope that you can remember what I've said today. Come and dine. Come and dine. It still rings in my, my mind. Come and dine. The Master calleth. Come and dine. He wants us to feast at his table. He wants to bless us in the presence of our enemies. He wants to do that. But we've got to allow him to do so. We've got to allow him to do so. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Lord, to break forth your bread. Lord, and I pray that I have done a good job this morning, Lord. Lord, that something I said may ring true in the ears of your believers, O oh God. Lord, that it will help them along the way, along the path that we take, Lord Jesus. Lord God, that it will strengthen them, to let them know that you want us to come and to dine at your table in the presence of our enemies, Lord God, that you will bless us on in. And Lord, to know that you are with us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Lord God, and we just pray. Lord, that your will will be done in this place, Lord, as we transition from one service to the next. Lord God, we just pray. Lord, that we keep our mind fixed upon thee. Lord, that the adversary will not try to come in here and steal what has been said. Lord God, we just pray, Lord, that we will worship you and praise you no matter what comes our way, no matter the trouble that we face no matter, Lord God, we always give you the praise because it says give thanks in all things, Lord, good and bad in all things. In Jesus' name I pray.